You're listening to Bible Prophecy Daily, a weekday podcast where Bible prophecy matters and matters greatly. Welcome back to the multi-week study on the Gog-Magog War. This is part four, who is Gog? So the question for this section is who or what is Gog? Ezekiel mentions him by name as the leader of the Northern Coalition. It says in Ezekiel 38, one through two, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal and prophesy against him. There really does not seem to be any agreement or consensus among scholars and commentators about the etymology or really anything else about Gog. The Anchor Bible Dictionary sums it up this way. Attempts to identify Gog have included proposals of connections with Gyges, king of Lydia, Gugu of Asher Banerpal's records, Gaga, a name in the Amarna correspondence for the nations of the north, Gaga, a god from the Rosh Shamra or Ugaritic writings, a historical figure, especially Alexander, mythological sources with Gog being a representation of the evil forces of darkness, which range themselves against Yahweh and his people. None of these identifications has been demonstrated with certainty. There are certainly other options that are not mentioned here, some of which we'll talk about in this section and in the next section. Um, I did look up some of these that I had not heard of before. For example, the idea that he is mentioned in the Rosh Shamra or Ugaritic writings. So I looked up and, and read those accounts and it did seem to be a dead end from my perspective. They were, it was a minor um, messenger God, which just seemed to have no relevance whatsoever to uh, this issue. One question is, does it really matter who Gog is? And I would say it depends. For example, if Gog turns out to be a human warlord who convinces several nations to go to war against Israel before the end of the 70th week of Daniel, or even after the millennium, I would say it would be of limited value. Because in that scenario, it would be unlikely that you would hear the name Gog mentioned before he was on the scene. And so, although it would be of great importance to know his name ahead of time if you were in that generation, it would be of limited value if you were not. Even if Gog turns out not to be a proper name, but some kind of title for this human leader, it would still be of limited value both practically and with regard to the interpretation of the rest of this text, which I would argue wouldn't change much either way. If Gog turns out to be the Antichrist, a popular theory among those that see the fulfillment of Ezekiel 38 and 39 at Armageddon at the end of the 70th week of Daniel, then yes, it would be a really big deal, at least in the sense that it would require you to interpret both Ezekiel 38 and 39 and Revelation 20 very carefully to stay within the bounds of that theory. For example, you would need to understand the many references to peaceful people dwelling securely in Ezekiel 38 and 39 as a false peace that is destined to be broken, not a picture of true security, which God demonstrates by his destruction of Gog can never be violated, thus fulfilling his promise of true security built up from chapter 33, which results in his glory. Instead, references to peace and security in Ezekiel 38 and 39, like the land that is restored from war, whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste, peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. I will go up against a land of unwalled villages upon the quiet people who dwell securely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, etc., as descriptions of Israel just before the Battle of Armageddon, which, for context, is after the seals, trumpets, and bull judgments have been poured out. That is to say, a time when every living thing in the sea is dead. There is no more green grass, and demon scorpions have been stinging people for five months. I mention that because I think people forget what the Armageddon is the same thing as Ezekiel 38 and 39 view necessarily requires them to do with the context of Ezekiel, which is to essentially disregard it and claim it's just a part of the Antichrist's false peace, as if that solves any of the problems with anything like normalcy, let alone even the perception of peace just before the Battle of Armageddon. Not to mention whatever false peace the Antichrist might have had with Israel was broken three and a half years before or Armageddon, even according to their views. 
As I say, it requires a lot from the interpreter to believe this view. The Armageddon theory also necessarily will inform your interpretation of Revelation 20, where in that case, it must not be the same war as Ezekiel, because in Revelation 20, it clearly says that that Gog-Magog war takes place after the thousand years have ended. And there is no theological possibility for the Antichrist to be involved in anything after the thousand years have ended, because he was taken off the board, as it were, and put into Gehenna a thousand years before this, which Revelation 20 verse 10 actually reiterates. There is a lot to discuss with the Armageddon view, and I am by no means dismissing it, as people that have been following this from the beginning know that my current theory is that Armageddon is a part of the fulfillment of the Gog Magog War. It is a typological prefiguration, that is to say, uh, near fulfillment of the ultimate far fulfillment. But in any case, there are some really good reasons to believe it is a part of the day of the Lord, that is to say, completely fulfilled in Armageddon. Um, I just believe there are better reasons to disbelieve that. In any case, in part five, I'm going to devote that entire study to just that topic. For this study, I want to deal with the possibility that Gog is a spiritual entity like a high-ranking fallen angel. To clarify, in this view, Gog would be a supernatural entity who deceives the nations into a war, much like Satan does in Revelation 20. But the nations and people involved are real nations and real people. I say here in this note that it would be of limited value if true, but I say that only in the sense that it wouldn't change much in the overall interpretation of these chapters or Revelation 20, but I do think it could be of value in the sense that there are some macro concepts that could be in play with the Gog Magog War that might not truly be understood or appreciated unless we understood that this war was kind of a big cosmic level thing happening and wrapping up a long awaited judgment for some principalities and powers. I'm not 100% dogmatic on this theory by any means. I only just discovered it during the course of this study, but I think it has the most evidence of any of the views I've seen so far. To begin discussing the angel theory of Gog, we need to go back to a topic we mentioned last time, which was the interpretation of the word Rosh in Ezekiel 38.2. I encourage you to go back and check that out if you haven't seen it, because I did go through all the argumentation showing that the word Rosh, which means head or first or leader or chief, should be translated as chief in that verse, as it is in most Bible translations. I will assume for now that you have understood and at least tentatively agreed with that argument and move on. The reason that's important is that if you understand that chief prince is the most likely translation of Ezekiel 38.2, it opens up another possibility for the identity of Gog. To read that verse again, 1 through 3, it says, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. This is because the term chief prince is used in the Bible and other ancient writings to refer to high-ranking angels, specifically what we call an archangel, as it is in the case of Michael, the archangel. Some translations choose to translate chief prince as in Daniel 10.13 or great prince as in Daniel 12.1 as archangel, but the idea is the same. Chief prince is an angel that ranks really high, and there are a number of them. As it says there in Daniel 10.13, Michael is just, quote, one of them. I'm going to read some of these verses for you audio listeners. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, and as I say, some verses will translate that as archangel, came to help me, for I was left there with the king of Persia. Another one from Daniel 12.1, at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, again, some versions will translate that as archangel, and in the New Testament, Jude says, yet Michael the archangel, and that's usually translated as archangel, but in the Greek, it literally says chief angel, when contending with the devil, he disputed the body of Moses, etc. This same passage in Daniel 10, among others, also show us that bad princes or bad angels exist and that they rule over certain geography. The princes of Persia and Greece are both mentioned in this passage as warring against the angel who brought the message and Michael, the chief prince. So Daniel 10, 13 and 20 through 21 says, The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the king of Persia. Then he said, do you know why I've come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. Uh, but I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side except these, except Michael, your prince. 
This is also reiterated to a certain extent in the New Testament, that is to say, ranking among evil spirits. One go-to is Ephesians 6, 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Also, you see this to a lesser extent in uh, Ephesians and Matthew, in which um, the prince of the power of the air is mentioned in Ephesians 2, 1 through 2. Also, there are a number of instances where the Pharisees are saying that Beelzebub is the prince of demons. So that's not necessarily a true thing because it is in the mouths of the Pharisees. Also in this view, it would be important to demonstrate that a chief prince can be over a certain area, in this case, over Eastern Turkey at the very least. Um, And we do see a biblical concept for this. Evil spirits have authority over certain geography. In Deuteronomy 32.8, this is after the Tower of Babel situation and God scatters the nations. He does so according to the number of the sons of God. And that term is used in other places to refer to angels, particularly of high rank, but other translations make this more uh, clear. But he essentially gives the nations over to these uh, entities. And of course, in the next verses, when he calls Abraham and says, you know, of you, I will make a great nation. So it's like a, a Abraham versus all the other nations, which are essentially ruled by the number of the sons of God. There is a lot of extra biblical supplemental data for this. Um, the only one I really feel comfortable with is First Enoch, though. And the reason I feel at least semi-comfortable with First Enoch is because it is quoted in the New Testament. The book of Jude says it was about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment, etc., etc. So Jude quotes from the book of Enoch. So you could at least say, I guess, that uh, that verse in First Enoch is canonical, while the others should certainly be taken with a grain of salt. And I agree with that. But I would also say that um, Enoch is an interesting book that when I read it, doesn't really conflict theologically with anything I know. I, I kind of think of it like the similarian to the, to the Lord of the Rings, uh, because there is just so much detail about the names of the angels and what their ranks are and all this stuff. And again, you take it with a super grain of salt, but I do think, generally speaking, when you find something in Enoch, you can confirm it or see it uh, in the Bible as well. So I, I tend to think of it that way when dealing with Enoch at all. Enoch gives detailed rankings of good angels like Michael, but first Enoch also reinforces the idea that there are chief princes or chief angels among bad angels as well. Often the terms chief and prince are used in various translations. Simjaz was the leader of the angels that sinned in Genesis 6, according to Enoch, and he goes on to name 17 other bad angels that are chiefs of tens. Enoch thinks that there are 200 angels that sinned, but he named 17 of the leaders among them. All right, with all that angelology in mind, let's move on to another important aspect of this theory, which we find in the middle of the Gog Magog portion of Ezekiel 38 and 39. It says, Thus says the Lord God, Are you he of whom I spoke in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who in those days prophesied for years that I would bring you against them? The reason this is important is that there is no other mention of Gog in most translations of the Bible other than in 1 Chronicles 5.4, where someone in Reuben's lineage is named Gog, but that person seems like just a regular guy and he has been long dead even by Ezekiel's day. So there's no obvious place this verse in 38.17 could be referring to, certainly not a place that would constitute a prophecy where the word Gog is mentioned. It also seems like we're looking for something a little bit weighty. I mean, after all, God is saying, are you he of whom I spoke in former days by my servants, the prophets? I don't know. It just seems like we're looking for something with some gravitas. Also, it sort of necessarily needs to be before Ezekiel's day. And I think there is at least one place that could fit in the Bible, which is Numbers 24-7, which says, Water shall flow from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. This is a prophecy of Balaam concerning Israel and the Promised Land, and it has strong millennial themes, as does the following passages in verses 10 through 25. The thing is, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, written some 300 years before Christ, 
The name in this verse is Gog instead of Agag. Further, every other manuscript we have of Numbers 24-7 agrees with the Septuagint reading of Gog, except for one, the Masoretic text, which is often used as the primary source for translating the Old Testament, and usually for good reason. The Masoretic text is an excellent witness, and arguably the most reliable manuscript evidence we have in regard to the Old Testament, but it is not an inspired text. The following are a few quotes from biblical scholars on this issue, which I got from unsealed.org. The first from Michael Reidelnik, which says, The Masoretic text is a post-Christian Jewish version of the Old Testament. As such, it reflects the theological perspective of post-Christian rabbinic Judaism. Thus, there are several significant examples of the Masoretic text interpreting the Old Testament Messianic texts in a distinctly non-Messianic or historical fashion whereas the other ancient versions interpret the same text as referring to the Messiah. He goes on to say, The Masoretic text of Numbers 24-7, which is our verse, presents a prophecy that would find its fulfillment in Israel's history. However, the alternate versions of this verse look forward to an eschatological messianic fulfillment. Another scholar quoted here, Salhammer, I think makes the point a little bit more clear. He says, The Masoretic text, which developed over a period of nearly a millennium, shows many signs of post-biblical, that is, secondary interpretation. The identification of the prophetically announced future king in Numbers 24-7b as the victor of Agag, Masoretic text, rather than Gog, Samaritan Pentateuch, Septuagint, Aquila, Sem... Machus and Theodosian, is clearly intended to link the fulfillment of the prophecy to David's day, e.g. 1 Samuel 15.8, rather than the Messiah's, Ezekiel 38.3. So I think it's clear that we found at least one prophecy of Gog in Scripture to connect to Ezekiel 38.17, which again says, Thus says the Lord God, Are you he of whom I spoke in former days by my servants the prophets of Israel, who in those days prophesied for years that I would bring you against them? But I would say, it seems like there would be more than just one. It does seem like it's plural, and it says they prophesied for years. So is there another mention of Gog? I think so. And here is a short list I made years ago with some strong candidates that I thought at the time may be speaking about the Gog-Magog war. It would include Zephaniah 3, 1 through 11, Joel 3, 1 through 16, Isaiah 66, 15 through 18, and Zechariah 12, 1 through 9, and 14, 12 through 15. I will be revisiting those in the course of this study, but suffice it to say that I think many of God's prophets have spoken about Gog, if not by name. Another instance I think I found during the course of this particular study is in 1st Enoch. And I like this one, and I'm going to read it for you because I think there's a line in here that sort of sums up the intent of the reason for the Gog-Magog war in the first place. It just sort of very well articulates what I've been trying to say about why I think the Gog Magog War happens in the first place. This is what it says. Then said I, for what object is this blessed land, which is entirely filled with trees, and this accursed valley between? Then Uriel, one of the holy angels who is with me, answered and said, This accursed valley is for those who are accursed forever. Here shall all the accursed be gathered together, who utter with their lips against the Lord unseemly words, and of his glory speak hard things. Here shall they be gathered together, and here shall be the place of judgment. In the last days there shall be upon them the spectacle of righteous judgment in the presence of the righteous forever. Here shall the merciful bless the Lord of glory, the eternal King. In the days of judgment over the former, they shall bless him for the mercy in accordance with which he has assigned them their lot. Then I blessed the Lord of glory and set forth his glory and lauded him gloriously." Now, this is chapter 27 of First Enoch. If you go back two chapters, there is unambiguously the millennium. I mean, it's very clearly millennial language. I don't think anybody would disagree with it. It is so clear. And this does seem to be a progression chronologically, too. So, again, you have in First Enoch this, I think, a progression from from the millennium to this moment. But my point about the reason was that line, the spectacle of righteous judgment in the presence of the righteous forever. Because my understanding of Ezekiel 38 and 39 when I read it is that it is a progression from chapter 33 in Ezekiel in which it is uh, talking about is Israel's blessings in the millennium and how everything will be okay then and they will be protected forever then. And the, the last part of that is sort of the testing of that judgment when you have Jesus ruling and reigning from the temple in Jerusalem that it cannot be defeated. It is a way to sort of 
to, to, to prove the glory of God, that it is in fact secure, it is in fact forever, which of course is what happens. I mean, Gog doesn't even get towards the land. It doesn't really do any damage. So what is the purpose of this war, if not to be a spectacle of righteous judgment in the presence of the righteous forever? And I think it's also interesting that the language as we get into the book is so, uh, presses that point. It's, uh, and then the nations will know, and then Israel will know, and then they will all know forever and ever and ever and it's sort of this wrapping up in a bow of a lot of different uh, uh, things. I'm actually tempted to go into this a lot more, but it really doesn't have to do with our study. There are some things like this accursed valley, a very interesting Greek word there that I think ties to Ezekiel. It's a long story. We'll get into it later. Another possible clue for the supernatural Gog theory is found in Ezekiel 39, 15, where the prophet describes the feast that the carrion birds will have when they eat the bodies of Gog and his armies, which were destroyed. It uses language that is very provocative for those that know much about the Nephilim and similar supernatural topics in the Bible. It says, You shall eat the flesh of the mighty, drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, and of he-goats, of bulls, all of them fat beasts of Bashan. Many of those terms have been used to describe mighty men of old, that is the Nephilim or other supernatural entities in the Bible. The mention of Bashan, let alone the bulls of Bashan, is provocative as well, since Bashan is where Mount Hermon is, the place where the fallen angels descended in their rebellion against God, which resulted in the Nephilim and the flood. Michael Heiser, who would agree with much of what I've said here about Gog, he does detail a lot of it in his presentations and in his book, Reversing Hermon. Um, I think we would disagree on the timing, and that's probably because I think we fundamentally disagree on the nature of the millennium, but that's another story. But we have a lot of agreement here on this Gog issue and the supernatural thing. And I did want to briefly mention his book because I think that his thesis in Reversing Hermon is that these sinful watchers in those that early prehistory moment and that sort of judgment that they got being locked in the abyss for a, a certain amount of time, that there is a final reckoning happening there. And it's big. And, and Jesus was dealing with it. And I think there is a final reckoning that happens in the end time with those angels. And I'm not sure I, I understand the full picture, but I think that Gog Magog may be a part of that. Um, that reckoning, if you will. And if you look at Revelation 20, where we know, for example, that Satan at the end of uh, Armageddon is locked into the abyss, the same place, by the way, where these angels that send at Hermon were lo have been locked in since that time. So they've already been in there for, since prehistory. Satan is locked in there only at the end of the 70th week of Daniel, and he's he stays in there for um, a thousand years. They, it says that he must be let out at the end of that. So they let Satan out of the abyss. He goes on to do what John calls Gog, Magog, gathers, deceives nations, gathers, gathers them together, blah, blah, blah. They're destroyed, etc., etc. And then he is finally judged. That is, Satan is thrown into Gehenna, a different pit. Now, this is interesting because, in again, I keep talking about Enoch, and I, I don't mean to give it more weight than it, than it needs, but Enoch does describe that whole thing. He he's, describes that there are essentially two two pits. One is eternal, one is not so eternal. One is a, has a time limit on it for these angels that sinned. But I'm getting off the subject here. I wanted to hit this idea from Michael Heiser's book, Reversing Hermon, in which he talks about the supernatural north aspect with regard to the Gog Magog War. So in Ezekiel 38, 15, it says, you will come from your place out of the uttermost parts of the north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding horses, a great host, a mighty army. So I think that Heiser would first agree that this is probably talking about a physical northern army coming from the J. Pathian cohort there in northern Turkey. I think that we agree that those are nor a northern uh, Turkey cohort. But he is sort of springboarding from this and also talking about this as what he calls the supernatural north, which is that the Israelites sort of feared the north and considered things that come from the north supernatural. And this is sort of what he uses to build the case that Gog is supernatural. And he has a lot of interesting points there. For example, the Israel word for north is Zaphon, which, uh, well, let me just read what he says here. But there was something beyond Bashan, far north, that every Israelite associated with other gods hostile to Yahweh. Places like Sidon, Tyre, and Ugarit lay beyond Israel's northern border. The worship of Baal was central in these places. Specifically, Baal's home was a mountain now known as Jebel al-Akra, 
situated in the north of Ugarit. In ancient times, it was simply known as Safon, that is, north, Safanu in Ugaritic. It was a divine mountain, the place where Baal held council as he ruled the gods of the Canaanite pantheon. Baal's palace was thought to be on the heights of Safanu, or Safan, in Ugaritic texts. Baal is the lord of Zaphon, Baal, that is, the lord of the north. He is also called a prince, Zebi, in Ugaritic. So, he makes some pretty good points there. I'm not exactly sure how much of the supernatural north concept or how far I want to take it, but I do think that there is something there. And I went down a bit of a rabbit hole trying to look at the Baal idea, and I just kind of got confused. I mean, so the mountain he's speaking of is kind of in eastern Turkey. So, it, you know, there's an interesting connection there with Baal. And is Baal the same thing as Satan or not? I mean, some commentators think so, some think it isn't. So at, at first I was thinking I was going to say that Gog is Baal. And it may be so. I think I think that's a strong contender as you can, might be able to tell, I'm not going to conclude this with a specific contender here because it may be that I don't know their name. They could be one of those, you know, captains of tens that Enoch mentioned that I, you know, some name that just out of nowhere. But I think Baal is an interesting contender. I think that the whole Bashan thing is interesting. If you look up the word Bashan, Og of Bashan, Og of Bashan, Og of Bashan is all over the Old Testament and it's associated with the Rephaim, with these supernatural entities. So, it, there's a lot to work with here, but I it, I just don't know. I also want to point out that it could be Satan um, him, himself. I mean, Satan is the only one I know for sure is gathering people together for war in the Gog Magog War, according to Revelation 20. It details. He gets let out of the pit. He goes and he... Um, you know, he gathers these nations together. For, for So it could be, and that would make sense of some of the texts. Are you the one that I spoke of my, of my ancient prophets and these kinds of things? But it doesn't quite fit. There are some other areas that I don't, I don't quite like it. But I do think that it is possible that these ancient beings, this, this reckoning that happens with these fallen angels that is necessarily in the future, I don't think happens at Revelation. I know some people will be thinking, well, what about the the locusts that are let out of the abyss in the fifth trumpet. It says there's an angel over the abyss, another Enoch connection, because he actually says the angel's name that is over the abyss. But nevertheless, I mean, again, I'm not trying to say that's canon or anything, but the, the function of those angels as in the day of the Lord judgment, they do not seem like anything such of a much. I mean, they, they have very strict guidance. They go out to sting people, only the people that God wants them to sting. They're basically lackeys, it just, and they only for five months. It could be. It could be them. I tend to think not. I, I do think that they're evil entities. They may be demons that have been sent to the abyss as, as the one in a, uh, that Jesus uh, cast out of the, uh, the man and went into the pigs. They begged not to be sent into the abyss, so that could be a possibility. I think these guys... Those that uh, that are in the abyss, these fallen angels, the Hermon guys, they have a different thing. So it may be that they are let out with Satan, and that would make sense of that uh, line, which you know I didn't really notice until the study in Ezekiel that we read earlier about the 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 he goats of Bashan. All of them will be eaten by those carrion birds, and that seems to really make me think that they all got released as a part of this major Gog Magog thing, and this is something bigger to to show the the end of them. Um, so I'm not coming with uh, any particular conclusion, unfortunately, with, with who it is. I wish I did have a, uh, a thing. I, unfortunately, there isn't a lot to go on with this. There's not a lot of reference material. So I kind of hope to hand this off to some of you that may be interested in it to try to figure it out further. I'm not sure how important it is to find out exactly if it's Satan or the name of the entity or if it even is. Um, because like I said earlier, I, I could fall back on the idea that Gog is just a, a warlord king that is uh, in, in the millennium. I think, as I have said before, I think this war does happen at the end of the millennium. So he could be just one of these guys that uh, rules over some tribes there in the north and his name is Gog. I mean, it could be that simple and nothing really changes here. Take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> we'll see you next time when I do want to hit something I think is substantial, which is the Armageddon theory. And I really want to dig deep into that and try to come up with some arguments either for or against it. Go to BibleProphecyTalk.com to subscribe to the audio podcast or to find the embed of this video. And we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Bible Prophecy Daily. 
We hope you learned something valuable today. Be sure to subscribe wherever you heard this podcast so you never miss an episode.